Hi, Randall Levy here, technical trainer at Henny Penny Corporation. In today's video, I'm going to show you some tips and tricks that you can do at the store level to help minimize some of those costly service calls. And we're also going to show some proactive tips to help maximize your uptime and keep your units up and running. So let's get right into it. We'll start with filtration. The first thing I want to know if I'm having some filtration problems is do I hear that filter pump motor running? The filter pump motor can be reset in the event that it's not coming on and has overheated and tripped the thermal overload. The key thing that we need to remember is we need to give it about 30 minutes to cool down before we go to the back of the fryer and try and reset that. Because if we don't give it the adequate 30 minutes to cool down, we could be wasting our time trying to reset it and it won't reset because it hasn't had the proper time to cool down. So let's go to the back of the fryer and take a look at what resetting that filter pump motor looks like. Here we have our filter pump motor located at the back of the fryer and you'll notice this red reset button right here on the side. After we've given it 30 minutes to cool down, now we can take and press this red reset button in and we should feel it click and reset. That will let us know that the filter pump motor has now been reset and we can go back up to the front of the fryer and try to run that filter pump motor again. But what about a scenario where maybe the filter pump motor is running? but the oil's just not coming back up to the top of the fry pot. Well, I'm gonna show you what you can do at the store level to try to help avoid some of those costly service calls. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So the biggest thing we wanna know with the switch in the pump position is do we have suction right here at our pipe going back to our filter pump motor at this dairy union connection? So we could take and unscrew this connection and with the switch in the pump position, we could take and put our finger over this opening while the filter pump motor is running to see if we have suction. If we have suction, then that's pretty much going to tell me that the problem is down in our pan. We could possibly have it put together incorrectly, or it could be heavily soiled and have a clogged filter pad. On open fryer models, we would check right here at our plug and play connection where our filter pan plugs into. We could do the same thing by putting the palm of our hand over this suction inlet and checking for suction with that filter pump motor running. If we have suction here, then that's going to tell me that our problem is likely in the filter pan, whether it be put together incorrectly or with a heavily soiled filter pad or possibly this dairy union connection loose and sucking air, or even better yet, we could have one of our filter pan O-rings right here missing or in poor shape, causing a poor seal for our suction. These O-rings are recommended to be replaced every 90 days, and they are crucial to the success of the filtration for the fryer. So be sure to check those and make sure that they don't need to be replaced. The other scenario that we could run into is maybe we're filtering fine, but maybe when we go to dispose our oil with our orange hose, maybe it's having trouble coming out the orange hose and causing that filter pump motor to make some odd noises. Well, don't worry, because there's an easy thing that you can do at the store level to help alleviate that problem. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Coming back to our open fryer, you'll see our male quick disconnect fitting here where we would hook our orange hose up to. What can happen is if our filter pan is put together incorrectly, allowing crumbs to get past the filter pad into our plumbing system, what can happen is they wind up on the back side of this fitting right here, and then they block that pathway, allowing oil to come out of our orange dispose hose. So what we can do is we can take an adjustable wrench after we've made sure that this is nice and cool and that the fryer is in the off position for safety reasons, is we can unscrew this fitting with an adjustable wrench. Then we can take it over to our three comp sink maybe and go ahead and spray that and rinse that out and try and get all those crumbs out of the inside of this fitting. And then afterwards, we can go ahead and screw that fitting right back on. Looking at our pressure fryer models, you can see that it's located right here next to our handles. And it would be the same process for this. Do keep in mind that there is a pipe on the back side of this plate, and sometimes that pipe will want to unscrew with this fitting, so you may need to put a backup pliers or an additional wrench on that pipe while you unscrew this fitting 
And then once you get it off, you can proceed the same way we did with the open fryer by cleaning the back side of this fitting out and then screwing it back on once we have it cleaned. So this is a great way that we can help alleviate some of those service calls that we might run across in some of those situations where the filter pump motor might not be coming on, or maybe it's coming on, but we need to know if we have suction or not. Like I had mentioned at our Dairy Union connection, the key thing to remember with our pressure fryers is we need to make sure that our filter valve is in the open position when we're running that filter pump motor. Otherwise, if it's closed, it won't give us any suction and we could think that something's wrong with the filter pump motor when it's actually not. So make sure that we have this open when we go to check for suction. And then also with the pressure fryers, remember you could have the Dairy Union connection loose, sucking air, so we would wanna make sure that's tight. Also, we talked about the orange dispose hose and something that we can do right there at the store level to help eliminate some of those costly service calls. A quick proactive tip that we can do at the store level to make sure we don't have some of these problems with crumbs getting into the system is at our filter pad, we want to make sure that this triangular bar is sealing our filter envelope properly. For Chick-fil-A filter pads, they are thicker than the normal envelopes that come with the fryer. So it's very important to make sure that we get the proper seal so that crumbs don't get on the inside here and then get into our filter system and cause us problems. So after inserting our woven filter screen into our new envelope, we wanna make sure that we fold this over so that we can seal that off. And then we wanna make sure that we put this triangular bar on and that it's properly on that lip sealing that envelope and not allowing any crumbs to get in here. Sometimes what you'll see is since the filter pads are so thick, it can be very difficult to get this triangular bar over that thick filter pad and on the screen. So what will end up happening is this triangular bar will just be sitting on top here like so, and it will not be sealing this surface. And then what happens is over time, crumbs will get into this envelope and end up causing us a lot of problems on our filtering system and can lead to very costly service calls. So we covered a couple items that we can do with filtration troubleshooting and help save on some of those service calls, but let's talk about some items that we can do at the store level to help save on pressure related issues. Some of the pressure related issues that you could come across in a day's time are maybe that the fryer is not building pressure, maybe it's building too much pressure, or maybe it's leaking around the lid while cooking, or how about taking too long to release pressure at the end of the cook cycle? I'm sure you've seen that one. What about the volcano effect, where you have oil and water coming out the stack at the back of the unit while you're cooking? These are all common problems that you could run into in a day's time that if we don't take proactive measures could lead to costly service calls. So I'm gonna show you a few different things that you can do at the store level to help avoid some of those expensive service calls. Let's talk about the first one. How about the unit not building pressure when you're cooking? Generally what that's gonna to equate to is when we're putting product in the fryer and then closing the lid to cook, usually what happens is we haven't put enough product in there to properly build the correct amount of pressure for the cook cycle. So when pressure frying, the unit gets its pressure from the moisture in the product, and if we don't have enough product in there, it won't be able to build adequate pressure in order to cook properly. The other item that we could run into sometimes is since Chick-fil-A uses the hybrid control and we can cook in both open and pressure mode, something to keep in mind that I've ran across before and talking to technicians and operators in the field is mistakenly they were cooking in open mode when they thought that they were in pressure and therefore the unit was not pressurizing during a cook cycle because it was in open mode. So remember, we can follow the instructions down here at the bottom of our screen to make sure that we switch that back to pressure mode so that it can cook properly and help avoid an unnecessary service call. How about too much pressure when cooking? Maybe some of us have seen on our gauge before while we're cooking that maybe this needle gets up into the yellow or past the yellow 
Now sometimes, if we're building too much pressure and simply cleaning the inside of this cavity did not solve the problem, what has to take place is this entire assembly has to be taken apart and thoroughly cleaned. And then also another item that we can do is we can take our deadweight brush and we can put in through this hole right here to try and help clean that pathway. And then the same thing up top, once we have our cap removed, we can put that deadweight brush down through there to try to help clear that pathway. But usually if we're getting too much pressure during a cook cycle, our problem is gonna lie in our deadweight assembly. So we, we wanna try to clean this as best as we could before calling for service. I'm gonna give you a valuable tip. The reason that dead weight gets clogged, like we were just talking, is because of excessive oil in the fry pot. So it's crucial to make sure that when that oil is all the way up to operating temp, that that oil level should not be above that top line on the inside of the fry pot. If so, if it's already above that line and then we add product, all that oil inside that fry pot has to go somewhere when we're cooking. So it's gonna go right out that dead weight assembly and into our steam stack, and that oil is gonna wreak havoc on our pressure system. Just like I had talked about crumbs causing problems in the filtering system, so can excessive oil in your fry pot cause you big problems with your pressure system and can eventually lead to costly service calls that we want to avoid. So keep that in mind in your day-to-day -day operations as you're walking by your fryers, always make sure that oil level is where it should be. So for units where we have steam leaking around the perimeter of the lid while we're cooking, one of the first things that we would want to check is make sure that the spindle is all the way closed and we have red ball to red ball. Another item that we could check would be our limit stop adjustment right here on our spindle. Keep in mind, this needs to be done every 90 days for proper pressure when we're cooking. Another thing we would want to check would be our lid gasket on the inside of our lid. This needs to be flipped every 90 days. So the same time frame that we're looking at for adjusting our limit stop on the spindle assembly. Keep in mind, if we're seeing a ridge here or excessive black charring, this is a good time to go ahead and flip that lid gasket. And once again, be sure to check out the instructional video on the Henny Penny YouTube help channel for that, how that process takes place. But what that would consist of is we would take this gasket out of this channel and then take and flip it and place it back into place and then tighten down our screws. This could help alleviate some of that steam leaking around the perimeter of our lid. So that covers us for steam leaking around the lid during a cook cycle. But let's talk about a scenario that we've all ran into. What about at the end of that cook cycle when the timer is beeping and saying that the product is done and it's releasing steam, but it's not releasing it fast enough and it won't allow us to open the lid because for safety reasons, it's still locked because there's pressure inside that fry pot. Well, let's take a look at the solenoid valve and how that has an effect with this. The solenoid is located at the back of our fry pot here, as you can see. Now, I had talked about earlier how devastating that excessive oil on the inside of the fry pot can be and how it can affect the dead weight with building too much pressure. Well, it has that same effect with our pressure solenoid and gumming up inside this valve and then what happens is at the end of the cook cycle, that valve is not able to fully open back up like it should, and it's not allowing that steam to escape as fast as it should in normal circumstances. So what we can proactively do to keep this from happening and this solenoid valve clogging up and potentially costing us an expensive service call is we need to make sure that we're maintaining the oil level inside the fry pot so that this valve doesn't get clogged up and cause us problems down the road. If you have an in-house service technician that's capable of handling this task, that solenoid valve can be taken apart and cleaned and then put back together, and a lot of times with no parts, this problem can be solved. There's a helpful instructional video on our Henny Penny Help service channel, separate from the Henny Penny Help channel, that demonstrates how to do this. But remember, the important part here is that if we're proactive and maintaining that proper oil level, that this will help prevent this from happening. So let's talk about the last thing, the volcano effect, right? 
I'm sure we've probably all seen it, where that oil and steam is coming out the stack at the back of the fryer, and it just kind of is going a little bit of everywhere. Well, I'm going to show you an easy tip that we can take care of that problem right at the store level without having to call for service and cause us a service call. So we'll go to the back of the fryer and I'll show you what to do. So remember, the last time we were at the back of the fryer, we talked about our filter pump motor. Well, you'll notice right over here, this is the bottom of our steam exhaust stack. And at the bottom of this, we have our drain condensation line that drains our excessive water vapors up to the front of the fryer and into our drain pan. Now what can happen is this can become clogged up with excessive oil that has gotten into the system, once again, from too much oil inside the fry pot, but it will collect in the bottom of this steam stack and then also in the bottom of this line. So what we can do is take an adjustable wrench after this has had time to cool down and with the unit powered completely down, we can undo this nut and then take this line off of this steam stack. And what we can do is after we get this apart, we can take a flat bladed screwdriver and put up inside this hole to kind of clear that obstruction that'll be in here and then clean that out. While we have that apart, this is a good time. If you can't get the obstruction clear right here in this line, you can take this whole line off and take it over to your three comp sink and soak it in some hot soapy water. This will help eliminate that clog that's inside this line. After that is cleared, then we can bring it back over to the fryer and put it back on and tighten up our compression nut here. So that's a great way at the store level, we can eliminate a service call just by knowing that we can take that condensation line loose at the bottom of the steam stack and clean it. A proactive tip there is something that we can do is once a month we can take a hot soapy detergent solution with hot water and we can pour down the steam stack and then allow that to drain out to the front of the fryer and our condensation drain pan. This will help prevent some of that oil vapors that could be collecting in there and that would eventually lead to a clogged system. So we talked about some of the pressure related troubleshooting that you could run into and some things that you can do at the store, but let's cover a few things that we can do proactively. Now some of those we've already covered a little bit, so you may see a little bit of overlap here, but let's talk about a few of those things. The first thing I want to talk about is our cross arm for our lid assembly. It's critical that we maintain this cross arm properly and give it the routine maintenance that it needs to get the most out of the life for it. The reason being, if we don't maintain this cross arm, what you'll find is you can have cracks right here in the cross arm. And the reason that is, is once these cracks start to go up the side, then this cross arm now has to be replaced. These can be very expensive, upwards of a couple thousand dollars. And to prevent that from happening, what we need to do is make sure that we are doing our limit stop adjustment on our cross arm every 90 days and also making sure that we lube our spindle on the back side of this plate here, and then also our ball seat, and then our spring down here at the bottom. By making sure that we're doing those lid adjustments on our cross arm every 90 days, what that does is that's going to greatly help prevent this cross arm from cracking and causing us a very expensive service call that ultimately results in a safety risk for the operator that's using this equipment if there is a crack here. So that's one of the proactive things that we can do that could end up saving us a lot of money by not having to replace this cross arm assembly before it actually needed to be replaced. With a properly maintained cross arm assembly, we should see many years of service from that. But if we're not maintaining it properly, this could need replaced in as little as just a few years of service. And at a couple thousand dollars, that can add greatly to our operating costs. I also mentioned lubricating this assembly as well. You should have your spindle lube that comes with the fryer. With lubricating the parts every 30 days, which tells us on the inside of our door here, this is going to greatly help extend the life of these components that are involved with this cross arm assembly as we're turning that each and every day. The other thing that we want to do proactively is make sure that we are flipping our lid gasket every 90 days. This is really going to help extend the life of the gasket and although it's not an extremely expensive part, it is an addition to our operating costs and help keeping those low 
and possibly even if we're not replacing that at the store level, then that's paying a technician to come in and replace that for us. Keep in mind, the reversing the lid gasket video is available on YouTube at the Henny Penny Help YouTube channel, and it shows us how to reverse that lid gasket. Keep in mind, it would be the same process with replacing the lid gasket as it would be reversing it. So if you need to replace that lid gasket, it's gonna be the same. Another proactive tip is making sure that our element spreader bars are properly torqued and maintained every 90 days. If not, what can happen is these can loosen up over time with the heating and cooling of the oil. What results from that is possibly premature element failure or possibly even a premature high limit failure because it's loose and now it's coming in contact with the basket or possibly some cleaning tools. This would also apply to our open fryer models as well with the element spreader bars and making sure the high limit bracket is tight as well. We would want to do that every 90 days. Also, while we're on the inside of the fry pot, we want to make sure that we're doing our clean outs on a regular basis so that we keep the inside of the fry pot clean and free from any carbon buildup. If we get excessive carbon buildup on either our high limit or our elements, this can cause premature failure. Especially with our high limits, it gives the high limit an inaccurate reading and can cause nuisance high limit trips when it really isn't at a safety risk. So by doing our cleanouts on a regular basis and making sure that the inside of this fry pot is clean, that can help save us from some future service calls that could be very costly. The last two proactive items are some that we already covered a little bit earlier in the training. Number one is making sure that that filter pad is sealed properly that so no crumbs get in there and wreak havoc on your filtering system. The other one is making sure that those O-rings are in good condition and that we have at least three of them. Remember, those are supposed to be changed every 90 days, just like a lot of the other items on our lid maintenance are at that 90 day mark. So if you remember the 90 day mark, we can assign someone in the store to do a lot of these different items. The only difference there is gonna be the lubrication of the lid assembly components, and that's gonna be every 30 days. So we threw a lot at you there. We talked about some troubleshooting tips on the filtration side of things. We also talked about some troubleshooting with the pressure side of the pressure fryers. And then we also talked about some proactive tips that we can do just in general. So let's go over a few of the common error codes that you could run across from time to time. The first one that you'll probably see the most is the E10 high limit error code. Well, the reason this comes up it is a safety device intended to keep the oil from getting too hot. Now, as I mentioned before, some of the things that can contribute and lead up to that is maybe that high limit has an excessive amount of carbon buildup on it, or potentially something that can affect it as well as if we accidentally hit it with a cleaning tool or maybe our basket hanger, is if it puts a dent in the bulb of that high limit, it can actually give it an inaccurate reading. So when that error code comes up, what do we do? Well, we don't want to call for service because that could be expensive. So the first thing that we want to try and do at the store level is reset that high limit. And just like we talked about with the filter pump motor and making sure that it has about 30 minutes to cool down, that same rule applies here. So whether we're talking about our pressure fryer or our open fryer, we want to make sure that we give it about 30 minutes to cool down before we go and try and reset that. So let's take a look at what that looks like for our pressure fryer. Well, if we open up our door, then on the inside of the door here, up behind our control panel on the bottom, there's going to be a red reset button that we're simply going to push up, and you should hear it click if it reset. If it didn't click, then that means it wasn't tripped. But again, remember, we want to give it about 30 minutes to cool down before we try and reset that. If it continues to trip after that, and we've given it proper time to cool down, this is where at that point we would need to call for service. But this is something simple that we can do at the store level to try to help prevent that service call. And remember, if we're seeing that air code come up, we wanna check the inside of the fry pot and make sure that it doesn't have a bunch of black carbon buildup on the elements or the high limit. For our open fryer model, that high limit reset switch is gonna be right here at the front of the unit. It's gonna be a black square-shaped switch that we just simply press to reset 
just like the red one on our pressure fryer. And the same rule applies here, giving it about 30 minutes to cool down before we try to reset that. And once again, if it continues to trip after that point, then this is where we could go ahead and call for service. Another common error code that we could run across on both of these fryers is the E15 error code. And what that means is it's recognizing that the drain is in the open position when it shouldn't be. So what we would want to do there is make sure that our drain handle is pushed in all the way and that make sure on our pressure model that it's closed all the way. But the thing we want to keep in mind with our open models specifically, there's an arm behind this panel here that engages that drain rod and that switch. Sometimes if we press this in too hard, it can bend that arm on that switch and cause the control to give an inaccurate reading. So if we see that error code come up on our open model and this handle is all the way in, we can look up underneath here and see if that arm is bent. If it is, we can try powering down the fryer and see if we can bend that arm back into place and see if that alleviates the problem before we call for service. If it persists after that, then that's where we would want to go ahead and call for service and that switch could possibly need to be replaced. The last error code I want to talk to you about is going to be the E27 or maybe even a W1 that could come up. Either one of those, this same process is going to apply. The thing that we want to be able to rule out is if it's the fryer, either one of these models, or if it's possibly something to do with the receptacle at the wall or maybe even in the store breaker. Because what we don't want to happen is if one of those error codes comes up and it actually turns out not to be the fryer and we call out a service company to repair the fryer but it ends up being the receptacle or the breaker in the store, then we've just called the wrong service repair company at an expense to our problem. So what we can do at the store level is if we see a W1 or an E27 on either one of these fryers, we can take and unplug the fryer and swap it with a different receptacle or another fryer to see if that problem follows the fryer or if it stayed with that receptacle at the store. Because if the problem follows the fryer, then we know that we need to call the fryer repair company. But if the problem stayed with that receptacle, then we know we need to call the electrical company. So this can help us distinguish who we need to call for sure, and also help speed up that process for the service call to get taken care of much faster. The last thing I wanna show you is where to retrieve those error codes in the event that maybe one of your team members has told you about an error code that came up in the past, but it's not coming up now, and we're not sure if we need to call for service or not. So I'm gonna show you a great way that we can check that right at the control panel. So we can do this with the fryer in the off position or in the on position. And the easy thing to remember is to hit the two outside buttons, which are gonna be our I and our P button at the same time. The great thing is, is the first thing that comes up is E-log. That's gonna stand for air log. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna hit this down button it's going to give us the current time and the current date. Now what we can do is press the down button and it's going to give us the last error code that came up. It's also going to give us the time and the date that it happened. So this is a great way if a team member had told us about an error code that had came up maybe yesterday or earlier in the day, we can come into our e-logs here and check and see exactly what that error code was so that we can relay that information to the service company if we have to call for service, or maybe it's an error code that we can take care of ourselves like we had just spoke about. So this is a great way to come in here and check e-logs, see what had taken place. We push the same two buttons to get out as the way we got in. So we covered several different things in this training to help you maximize your uptime and also help avoid some of those costly service calls. We talked about some of the things that we can do at the store level to where we can draw that line when it comes to filtration related items or maybe pressure related items on what we can do at the store level versus when we need an actual technician to come out and take care of that for us. And then we also talked about some of the error codes that we could see come up from time to time and what causes those to come up. And remember, we also talked about the cost associated with the lid assembly. 
If we're not doing the limit stop adjustment on a regular basis, how that can lead to cracks in the cross arms, providing a safety issue for our team members, and then also causing a very costly service call in the long run. So these are several things that we can do to help maximize our uptime and keep our service costs low. I hope you found this training helpful. Be sure to check out our Henny Penny Help YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe and check out some of the operational instructional videos we have there to help you. Thanks and take care everyone.